network and maybe even choosing like one neural network architecture, choosing BERT over GPT-2 or whatever for your project. Uh, that's not the most interesting part, but it's the part like how do I connect it to the real world and real problems and also Welcome to AI India Community Podcast Series. Myself, Neeraj Nunawat. Today we have Thomas Veerman. Thomas is a core PyTorch contributor and distinguished member of PyTorch community. Today he is going to share with us how to use PyTorch community resources more effectively, how to get started with deep learning. Altogether, this is going to be an interesting session. Here Thomas will be sharing his views on different different topics. Also, Thomas is a founder at Math in Munich, German based company. Thomas is the author of Deep Learning with PyTorch book. On his website, it says Thomas is a retired programmer. But I am damn sure we can learn a lot many things out there from the Thomas. I recommend you guys to follow Thomas on Twitter. On Twitter, he share a lot of interesting stuff about PyTorch, Deep Learning. I'll, I'll, I'll add his Twitter uh, link in the description. With this, I would like to welcome Thomas Veerman to today's session. Welcome, Thomas. And uh, thank you for the for the very nice introduction. Uh, it's a it's a real honor to be here, and uh, I stand, it's one of the last nice autumn weekends. Uh, so. Uh, it's a, it's great to be here. It's uh, for me. It's in the morning. For you, I think it's in the, and you're right. It's in the afternoon, right? And yeah. uh, and uh, uh, so uh, uh, it's a great honor to be here with you, and uh, also the uh, uh, you're interested in okay. the little things I have to say. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, I've introduced you uh, to the community. Would you like to introduce yourself? Would you like to tell your story uh, in, in your style? Yeah, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure. So probably part of the reason I'm here is uh, because I was happy enough to uh, join uh, in, uh, my great co-authors Eli Stevens and Luca Antiga uh, uh, for, uh, for this book and uh, probably because it has been available from uh, the PyTorch website for a while. You might have downloaded it. Um, and so uh, uh, <laughs> how did I come here? Uh, uh, how did I get to write this book? Well, I uh, uh, was hanging out in, uh, in PyTorch a lot. And uh, so if you, if you have uh, you have seen PyTorch, there's a, a community forum there. Um, and I've been hanging out there a lot with my uh, good friend, uh, Pierre. Um, and uh, uh, he is one of the one of the most active, he's the most active person on the PyTorch forums. I think he has answered like 25,000 questions over the years uh, for users around the world. Uh, help them debug their nitty gritty CUDA problems or, or just giving uh, uh, advice to people who start basically from from zero. And so every now and then uh, I try to answer a question there. Uh, if we reach back a little bit more, uh, so uh, uh, I was lucky enough and for people as old as me, for you it's probably normal, but uh, in my age, it was I was quite fortunate to have a computer uh, when I was uh, around six. Uh, so I learned to read, write, and uh, Commodore C16 Basic uh, at the same time. Uh, and uh, I've always been trying to uh, kind of try out what's possible with computers there. Uh, I think my first application was drawing bot charts uh, for some statistics that my dad used at work. Um, and so I spent a lot of time on computers and eventually also on 
computer networks, like in the olden times, there was FidoNet, uh, and then there was the internet, of course. Um, and from there, I uh, uh, joined uh, Debian. I was a Debian developer for a while. So uh, uh, I have some bit of uh, like this sharing spirit, this free software uh, thing in me. Of course, it was a luxury to have the time as a student to also contribute there. Um, in terms of studies, I started out studying computer science, but then uh, I moved into maths because uh, uh, mainly for personal reasons and because I, uh, I like the uh, I, I like the subject and that excited me. Um, after my PhD in mathematics, so I have a PhD in pen and paper mathematics. And Good to know your story, Thomas. Uh, in between that, you mentioned about PhD. So how was your PhD journey? How did you came in the deep learning after your PhD? I mean, uh, how was the transition of one mathematician to the deep learning? I'm sure having a PhD in mathematics must have helped you to understand machine learning in a better way. Yes, yeah, so uh, actually while I was still studying, I took a class in neural networks and uh, uh, pattern recognition. And back then, I still remember my professor Joachim Buhmann, who's now uh, at the ETH in Zurich, uh, he said, well, yeah, neural networks, these are neat because they're so robust to overfitting because back then uh, neural networks didn't have many layers and they certainly didn't have many as many variables as they have today. And uh, so I moved to mathematics and then I helped uh, insurance companies with their mathematics like uh, risk calculations for a while, uh, actually for nine years. Uh, before I then returned to the roots, I started out using uh, uh, using Theano, and then uh, uh, gradually I tried to get TensorFlow for Windows to run at work. Um, and eventually, I ended uh, in, in 20, 2017, I discovered PyTorch for me, and uh, also the whole the whole universe around around PyTorch. So uh, uh, maybe uh, because I uh, uh, because I uh, uh, I'm, I'm incredibly proud of that. I'll show you uh, something from my PhD thesis. I always say this is uh, pen and paper mathematics. Uh, uh, this is from my PhD thesis and so actually I tried to explain mathematically what's going on on this photo. Uh -huh. And uh, it's, a, it's a fridge magnet, if you want, in its demagnetized state. And the white and uh, uh, dark regions, the light and dark regions, they are uh, 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 microscopic uh, uh, visualization, or they, they made the magnetic domains magnetization visible. So you have a, like a branching pattern here. And so uh, I tried with pen and papers and over 100 pages here, I think something like this to explain why this pattern has to be there by energy minimization. And so while this is like a pen and paper math topic, uh, uh, it also is if you want uh, uh, something something ultimately very, very practical. And uh, so I moved back to, to PyTorch and I experimented a bit. And the first thing I learned when I was doing PyTorch, and you can follow this on my blog if you want, was uh, like the Wasserstein GAN was pretty new and exciting. And so I wrote a little blog post on this, and I also joined the PyTorch forums. Mm -hmm. And just if you didn't, uh, didn't see them yet, it's uh, like, uh, this forum, and there you can see an hour ago, I tried to answer something every now and then. Uh, but so uh, uh, this is a, a great community, both uh, uh, for beginners, 
uh, but also like any Python question. And for me, also a lot of the discussion. Yeah, this this forum is look awesome, you know. Took uh, part, uh, took part in this. Uh, uh, this forum is uh, this, this forum is having a bunch amount of resources. Lot many resources are there, and uh, people are there from the across across the globe, you know. So you can ask them. Well, ask them any question, uh, and people are there from all the level. Experts are there. Uh, Right. There. So good. And good to start. And of course, there's lots of great people. And if you look at the statistics, it's uh, it's really unreasonable how many extremely good answers uh, Pierre has posted over the over the years. Um, so I got a bit active there, and soon enough, uh, back in 2017, PyTorch wasn't as complete as it uh, is today. And uh, uh, while doing Wasserstein GANs, uh, I bumped into second derivatives not yet being implemented. And so I thought, well, I can fix that uh, and try it. And with the help of Adam Peschke, I, uh, I managed to kind of get into doing PyTorch. And I think by now I have some 160 something uh, error fixes and features uh, that are implemented in there. Um, and this is basically one thing I still do. If you look at the blog, uh, uh, and here I make a, a plug my blog here, it's Learn Apparat. Um, I still try to have a mix of doing things like uh, uh, more conceptual things, like how many models is ResNet. If you know ResNet, you're scratching your head and say, I'm silly. But uh, this is kind of a more theory uh, thing, but also do like th things that um, uh, that uh, try to discuss PyTorch technicalities in depth, and uh, and also some optimization uh, things. So this is what I do. Um, more recently, I've also been uh, uh, trying to get into online courses. We all do this. Uh, and so with my company, and I'll say a bit about that later, uh, I started doing uh, like PyTorch, PyTorch courses. Uh, and so this is m maybe about me. Uh, Your book, Deep Learning with a PyTorch, is a really great workflow on a PyTorch. Can you tell us how did you guys come up with it? What was your motivation behind writing that book? Yeah, I am of the three people you could have asked about this. I'm the worst to ask, but uh, I'll tell you the straight truth here. Uh, I've been doing a lot of things with Pierre on the, from the PyTorch forums, and we always have these like little nitty gritty details about PyTorch that uh, I always joke, yeah, in Pure in my book on PyTorch, it will be explained in chapter 32, something like this. And so, and it's an imaginary PyTorch book uh, of the two of us. And so Eli and Luca, I think it was Luca, approached me whether I wanted to join in on the real PyTorch book. And so I joined in uh, about at the time when uh, a, a lot of the first part was already written and a lot of the second part was already drafted. Um, and so I, uh, I think the idea was to really uh, write a book that is uh, uh, where you not only learn something, but that's also, also fun to follow along. And that was one of our main goals. And uh, Eli Luca uh, did a really great, great job at setting the, the tone. And I kind of tried to chime in. So it was a, a harmony. Uh, uh, and and the, what the bits that I ended up writing, uh, uh, that they fit in seamlessly. And if you don't see very large style breaks, I think that has succeeded. Um, part of the credit also goes to the to the editors at Manning, uh, Francis uh, uh, 
Lefkowitz uh, and and also uh, Brian Hanafi, they've been they've been great editors. I think uh, uh, the book is much better uh, uh, because because of their work too. Yeah, good to know your book writing story. Can you tell Can you tell us how one can get started with the deep learning in two thousand twenty two? Uh, uh, obviously, if you're starting out and you know some Python, uh, I think our book is a is a good resource. In, in fact, I've been looking at uh, doing an, an online course in the PyTorch 101 certification, and I found that uh, I can I can like take a lot of structure from the from our book. So uh, uh, even if it's like telling my own how and I think uh, it's a it's a good resource um, and then I think don't try to learn all about PyTorch and or all about deep learning and then find the application but do find the application even if it's a playful application like the one I showed in the beginning uh, do find something that you really want to do and that kind of looks similar or like you have some idea of how you might build it from from uh, uh, from uh, uh, existing by adapting existing things, and uh, I think this is something uh, that really goes a long way. And of course, uh, if you're thinking more in terms of career, uh, I think having having a blog, blogging a lot, being active on the forums, and also contributing code. Uh, uh, that really helps you build credentials. And I might share that uh, I have an email address that I only use for GitHub commits. And I uh, do regularly get job offers from the usual tech companies uh, uh, to that address that I only use on GitHub. So I know they they have been looking at, uh, uh, at the uh, open source contributions uh, in terms of uh, who they think are interesting. The other bit of advice is don't do it alone. Uh, find either a group of people or at least someone uh, who you'd like to work with, kick ideas with, uh, also who gives you a second pair of eyes when you're stuck, because that really happens to everyone, uh, that they're stuck or that they have a problem with a... <laughs> Well, they can't really make sense of things. And then somebody goes and says, well, yeah, but this is uh, something very, very easy. Uh, and I have these two. <laughs> and then I'm very happy to have someone who, who looks at my stuff and says, well, yeah, but you just need to do A and B. And we all have that. Don't be, don't be ashamed of it. Um, and it's a good idea to find someone to collaborate with uh, just to have this interaction uh, every now and then. And also have someone to to show off your your new things that you built, right? Yeah, this is a really good uh, path in order to get started with deep, deep learning. What do you think, Thomas, what can be the future of deep learning in the upcoming time? One thing I really, really like about deep learning uh, is that, in a way, it reduces uh, the amount of programming you have to do, uh, because uh, training models really takes uh, the place of a lot of like more detailed software algorithm engineering. Um, and that can only be good, because now uh, software doesn't necessarily have to be made from programmers only, but you can bring in uh, experts for whatever field, and they can use and leverage uh, deep learning for their subjects. And of course, we've, we've seen this, or we are seeing this with things like uh, uh, drug discovery, uh, uh, where we can expect like huge benefits uh, uh, from uh, being able to, to have a much shorter path from like uh, uh, people that are into pharmaceutical research to uh, uh, to uh, to having a computer help you, and reducing this 
the the amount of of like pure programming effort that goes into it i think that's a that can be a great thing and so i would ex so i'm more excited about the about the breadth of uh, deep learning and the and the wealth of applications that uh, uh, present uh, uh, that deep learning enables uh, more than uh, uh, I'm excited about prospects of having an, uh, a general artificial intelligence or not. So uh, I like this kind of spreading the use of computers for for nifty things a lot more. Also medical. I mean, our book has the medical example uh, of going through CTs automatically, which is something that is like boring and dull to to radiologists, and so it's good that computers can help you. You are founder at MathInf, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So, what are you doing there? Could you tell us more about it? Yeah. So. Uh, uh, MathInf is a, uh, it stands for Mathematics and Inference. Um, and it's a boutique PyTorch and machine learning uh, consultancy. And I also do trainings. Um, so I, uh, I, I did inference consulting for quite a while. And then I didn't know anything but consulting. <laughs> and so. I started to help people uh, making the most use of uh, deep learning, machine learning, and PyTorch. And I do so by offering courses and bespoke workshops for companies. Recently, I've also done online courses, which you can then join individually. Um, I also do quite a bit of like more conceptual work. For example, uh, 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 recently, we uh, this is a joint project with Arabics, which is the uh, the company the company from of uh, of Luca, uh, my co-author, uh, and together we did uh, a library called Torch Drift. So this is a project that helps you check out uh, uh, check out uh, the uh, whether your model is still working as expected when you have deployed it. Uh, this was one of the more mathematical works also that, that I did. So I tried to kind of build on the state of the art, add new things for my clients. Um, I also have quite a few things where I just try to either enable new things or with PyTorch or make things really, really fast. Uh, uh, and so this is the kind of work I, I help people with um, in addition to, to the training. Good to know about your company. Uh, well, uh, next question is that I would like to ask, how did you become core PyTorch developer? Okay, so I should say here that uh, PyTorch core developer is more like a honorific title <laughs> than uh, uh, than it was that I was part of uh, some of some committee or something that actually made decisions. Like in other truly open source projects, you have like the Python core developers; they will uh, kind of decide where the where the project is going. Uh, with PyTorch, of course, uh, Facebook uh, basically owns PyTorch, and so they make all the decisions. And this was like a honorific title for submitting a lot of PRs. And uh, I think among the independent contributors, I might be one of the most prolific ones. And in particular, I also kind of submitted patches to almost every part of PyTorch. Um, yeah, that's. That's how I got there. And basically, whenever I use software uh, uh, and I find something where it doesn't work as well as it should, I can't resist, or most of the time, I can't resist the urge to fix it. <laughs> and this is this is kind of what got me into contributing to PyTorch. Uh, and also, I, uh, I, I felt really welcome by, uh, by the great people. So on the forums, there's Piotr, uh, but also I've been uh, I've been great friends with uh, Adam Paske and 
uh, also Sumit and Francisco, Francesco Massa from Torch Vision. Uh, and they've been all very patient and very welcoming. Uh, and so this was a great experience. And so I naturally contribute. I tried to contribute a lot. And then uh, there was this honorific title of PyTorch Core Developer. How do you see PyTorch framework development in the upcoming years? Or more or uh, where do you see PyTorch in the upcoming years? Well, so uh, 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 one of the things we are seeing is that they're making, uh, uh, they're working on making more and more optimizations uh, available, uh, things where code is compiled on the fly and you can uh, like do some optimizations that you can't do when you have like a predefined set of functions and then evaluate one by one. Um, and so really this has been a push for PyTorch for the last couple of years and it's still ongoing. Uh, you have like the JIT uh, uh, that enables a lot of this and there's a lot of great work done there. Uh, and also we're seeing that uh, there will be there will be more support uh, for other hardware. And, uh, and so maybe at some point it won't be uh, uh, by a super expensive GPU to do PyTorch, but uh, there, will be, there will be other options and more commodity options too. Okay, so um, you see, I mean, the next five years, uh, I mean, these are your thoughts, correct? Right. Yeah. So it's hard to predict. But so one thing I like about PyTorch is that I really try to keep an ear on uh, what people are using it for. And in particular, that they have this idea that catering to research means catering to future applications. I think this has been a great reason for their success. Uh, uh, and I think this will probably continue. But of course, I don't know what researchers will invent in the next five years because it's such a fast moving field, right? Well, moving forward, let me ask you the next question. What do you like most about PyTorch framework in comparison with other frameworks? Well, so uh, uh, I, I mentioned that I was uh, using using Theano and TensorFlow before, and then when I came to PyTorch, I just thought, well, yeah, this this feels more natural for me. Um, and of course, this is something that uh, other people have said too. And uh, of course, TensorFlow with TensorFlow 2.0 made great progress and maybe making the experience more more natural too. Uh, the other thing I like about PyTorch a lot is that uh, you can stay in PyTorch for a really long time uh, uh, and don't have to like convert your model to something and then it's gone from PyTorch. Uh, so for example, in this webcam example, uh, uh, I, could, I could do, I could run the webcam program and that would be just a few lines of Python with PyTorch uh, uh, doing the, all the processing. Um, and I could even quantize these models and deploy them somewhere on the Raspberry or whatever. Uh, and I could still stay in PyTorch. And this is really neat for programmers because they don't need to learn like 10 things to, to get their model out there, but they can stay, stay in Python and PyTorch if they want. I wanted to show you something uh, that I recently made uh, that I thought was uh, was great fun, and so and it also helps us to learn a little thing, uh, and that is uh, uh, and that is that that usually you don't build just a model unless you're doing research. You don't just build models and train them. Um, but you also build like systems. And uh, so one of the things you know, and I don't have it enabled here, uh, 
I don't have it enabled here on my video. You can see my office in the background. I cleaned it up a bit, uh, um, but uh, uh, usually you can see the 3D printer too. But so you, you know that all the other people have fancy backgrounds in, yeah. their, uh, in their video conferences. And so quite a while ago, I asked myself, well, what would it take to, uh, uh, to make such a virtual blue screen or green screen? And so I tried. So one of the first things you need is you need to cut out the person, right? Uh, you just want the head and, and not the background. Uh -huh. And so how would you do this uh, uh, with, with like neural networks? And, My background? Uh, well, how would, you, how would you do like these virtual background things that video conference tools have? How would you cut out the person? Uh, I think this is more of a chroma keying problem. Uh, like you add green screen background to add uh, animation effects in the movies like uh, some people add green screen in the behind and they add uh, animation effects later on for the in initial demonstration i'll be using open cv here that's the good that's the right way to do it but so uh, uh, the other way to do it might be of course to uh, 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 take this as a segmentation mm -hmm. uh, task and so uh, uh, what you can do is uh, if you read our book, and I'll shamelessly make advertisement for that. Uh, uh, if you read the book, what we do is we try to find uh, lung nodules. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and the way we do it is by uh, by doing a segmentation with something called a unit. And uh, obviously in the book, it's explained much better as I can, but it's basically a very short neural network. You can, uh -huh. I mean, it almost fits on one page here. I'll not describe it in detail, but basically you have, uh, uh, you have here a branch that goes down and then there's something going up again. And if you want to know it in great detail, you'll have to check out the book. And there's a data set uh, that is quite commonly used uh, called MS Coco. Uh, and so what I did here was, and it says no kernel, I have to redo it. Uh, what I did here was I implemented such a net and then I also did a bit about the, uh, the loss function and I'll say one thing about the data set in a bit. And so I trained this for a few lazy epochs to get a uh, neural network, and I'll skip the training now for time reasons. Um, and uh, you get a neural network that, uh, oops, there, I didn't run all the, all the intermediate things. But okay, now we have a neural network, and what it does is you give it a photo, and it will tell you where the persons are. Um, like uh, if uh, I, yeah, yeah, this was about the, the persons, and so here's a picture I took of me so, earlier yeah, you, today. Yeah, yeah, you're using completely uh, Tosh with PIL. Yeah, it, it's a, I mean, you can do it simpler, but uh, so this is a unit that does this. And one of the things you have to see is if you do it naively, you will have lots of images that are just blank predictions. And you have to be careful about this because uh, uh, basically this is an imbalanced classification problem and all the blue stuff which is kind of not a person. Uh, it will uh, it will be the majority class, and the interesting bits are the minority class. So you have to do some things to uh, to kind of balance uh, uh, the classes if you train the unit. But so this is we we take a unit, 
Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, the next thing I did was I wanted style transfer. So I just uh, 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 looked for a uh, uh, linear style transfer. And I found something on the, on the internet. It's also always good to, to look around. And these days you find so many great projects. So from uh, uh, Sunshine at Noon, and they also published a paper on it, Learning where they have... Oh, I see. Right. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a great project. And these days, a lot of projects are implemented in PyTorch directly. So you can just uh, run this. And because I'm, I'm a two-pointer person, I uh, uh, just imported his, their, their data set here into, uh, into Jupyter. Mm -hmm. And here I can style transfer. Oh. But obviously, yeah. it st style transfers the background too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, One thing you can you can do it more sophisticated in a more sophisticated way, but you can now combine these two, right? Mm -hmm. And then you need to feed it back into your webcam. And also there, there's a project called okay, Fake Webcam. If okay, and what I what I did now, I just want to introduce this as a playful project, if you want. And so I took these three ingredients, and then uh, uh, if I if I take these uh, and I come to here, uh, you see that with these three ingredients, like a simple unit, like you can learn from the book, and then uh, uh, the star transfer network are lifted off the internet, and this uh, fake Python PyTorch webcam. Uh, I have something that is much less sophisticated than, of course, the things that Zoom or Google or whatever will have as backgrounds. Uh, but I made it all myself, right? And yeah. that's not nothing. Uh, and so instead of like telling you a lot about my philosophy and things, I just wanted to to share with you as a community, like find a playful project and then kind of think about how you can combine different things, and this is one of the one of the take-home things I want to I want to also kind of share with you here is that uh, most of the times, like doing the neural network and maybe even choosing like one neural network architecture, choosing Bird over GPT two or whatever for your project. Uh, that's not the most interesting part, but it's the part like how do I connect it to the real world and real problems? And also, how can I connect different components? In our book, we're doing this with a unit, and then we have a classification on top of that. Uh, or here, I have the unit, and then I have the style transfer, and then I need to get it from the webcam and feed it back into the, into the fake webcam. And so if you want to know how to get started with deep learning, because this is always a question that I'm asked to answer. And depending on my, on my mood, I'll give different answers every time. Okay. Uh, so if you, if you look at the, I don't know if I can make a little bit of advertisement, but uh, last month, Weights and Biases had a, had a great PyTorch uh, reading group for our book. And you can check out the videos in the forums. Uh, over there, and there I had an introduction like how to make most of the PyTorch community. Uh, but here, I don't want to repeat that in case you watch both. Uh, and I just want to share you, how do you get started with deep learning? Okay. Yeah, find a fun project and just implement that, even if it's not as big as prof and professional as other things. Uh -huh. um, so this is really, Kind of the kind of things that uh, I like to do when I have some some time on my hand, which is of course uh, much much too rare, uh, uh, but uh, it's uh, it's something something I like to do. So this is a, a bit of an of an older project from me, 
Um, I have a, I have a, I have a very new project. If you look at GitHub, uh, and there I ask myself, well, how do these transformers really work? And I'm working on a transformers uh, course also. And uh, what I did in preparation, and I should be able to spell my own company's name. Uh, in preparation, I built a nifty transformer library that uh, uh, implements like the most popular transformers, vision transformers. Uh, also BERT and GPT in a mere 400 lines. Um, and so find a project that is fun, uh, built on things that are uh, out there uh, uh, and, uh, and just do a fun thing in order to uh, get started with, with deep learning. So this is this is what I had prepared, and maybe I'll uh, switch back to the normal camera again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now moving forward, we have a rapid fire round. Well, Python or R? Oh, Python any day. <laughs> okay. I'm not smart enough for R. <laughs> <laughs> okay. TensorFlow or PyTorch? Oh, PyTorch. <laughs> okay. AWS or GCP or Microsoft Azure? I'm an on-premise person. I always use my computer in the basement. Oh. Well, I mean, if you have small models to train, then having your own computer is probably more economically. And if you have like very large models to train, you probably choose the, <laughs> the cheapest option because it, I mean, you can rent a cluster from from these cloud providers that cost a million dollars per day, uh, and then you probably take the one that is cheapest, right? Spider, Jupyter notebook, or PyCharm? Yeah, you already saw that. I'm a Jupyter person. <laughs> yeah. And actually, I like the notebooks better than the Jupyter lab, but that might be me. Well, last thing, uh, last uh, rapid fire question. Deep learning or machine learning? Uh, it depends. If you need to be really, really marketing y, say AI, um, and then uh, I usually say machine learning because uh, uh, when sometimes deep learning is the best choice, but often it's also kind of best combined with more traditional techniques from, from classical machine learning. Thank you so much people for watching our, this episode. Uh, if you have any suggestion, ideas, feel free to share your thoughts in the comment box. Thank you so much. I'll see you in the next one.